Verse 6 says this, For I am the Lord, I do not change. Therefore, you are not consumed. Aren't you grateful that you're not consumed because God does not change? Not because of what you have done or what you have said or who, how good you are. God is saying the reason why you are not consumed and you've not been overcome by what you're going through is because I do not change. I am faithful, I am able, I'm a good father, and because I do not change, you are not consumed, O sons of Jacob. Yet, from the days of your fathers, you have gone away from my ordinances, and I have not kept them. Return to me, and I will return to you, says the Lord of hosts. But you said, in what way shall we return? Then God said, will a man rob God? Yet, you have robbed me. Some of you have been triggered already. But you say, in what way have we robbed you? And God answers, in tithes and offerings. You are cursed with a curse, for you have robbed me, even this whole nation. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse, that there might be food in my house. And try me in this now, says the Lord of hosts. If I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you such blessing that will not, there will not be room enough to receive it. And I will rebuke the devourer for your sake so that he will not destroy the fruits of your ground. Nor shall the vine fail to bear fruit for you in the field, says the Lord of hosts. And all nations will call you blessed for you will be a delightful land. How many of you want to be a delightful land? Absolutely. Turn to your neighbor and say, avoid the umbrella. Most of you are not excited to see them. Turn to the other one that you're excited to see, apparently, and say, avoid the umbrella. We're going to talk about the benefits of tithing today. Father, Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for the access we have to your presence. We do not take it for granted. We do not take it for granted. We do not take it for granted. Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in your sight. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you so much. How many, how many of you have heard of someone who is considered to be ahead of their time? Like just ahead. The things they are doing are just out of this world that we cannot cope with their time. How many of you know any, anybody like that? Um, Plato was considered ahead of his time. So even though he's, he laid the foundations of f f f f f f f philosophy, um, he's also credited with um, over 70 innovations harnessing the power of steam um, long before anybody had those. He actually was behind, and his inventions were behind the British Industrial Revolution over 2,000 years after he died ahead of his time. Um, Leonardo da Vinci was ahead of his time. He's uh, considered one of history's agreed polymaths. A polymath is someone who is um, skilled in a large number of diverse areas. You're like brilliant in all kinds of things. Um, shoulder to shoulder with his painting um, of the Last Supper and the Mona Lisa are the flying machines and the parachutes that he designed, and most of them never came to see the light of day because there were no supporting technology around him. So we got to experience his awesomeness when he was gone. Um, and for every true child of God and believer, the iPhone and Steve Jobs was ahead of their time. While the pagans and the unbelievers were playing around with typewriters and type pads on their phones, God raised a man and he gave us a phone without an actual type pad for which we are grateful. <laughs> he was a man and the iPhone still remains till today against all odds ahead of its time. The prophet Malachi could be said also to be ahead of his time because his book sits a hundred years after the Babylonians had released the children of Israel, they had left their exile in Babylon, and now they had come back home. But true to their character, it had not changed them in any way. They were still, they had abandoned God as their God. They were treating God like any kind of way. There was nothing. Uh, uh, it did not do anything to harness their devotion for God. And the nation was such, in such chaos 
Um, the Bible says that they actually complained and they doubted and they challenged God's love for them. And God had to make a case for his love for them. Their worship of God was so corrupt that they would bring animals that were blind, maimed, disfigured, diseased as sacrifices to God. And God uh, uh, was almost, you know, actually, the Bible actually says in Malachi, God was, I wish my temple could be closed down instead of all the sacrifices, this disfigured animals you're bringing to me. Because they, they had no regard for God and for the standard of worship. The priests actually had so adulterated their preaching and their teaching of the law that it, it, it diluted the people's worship of God. There was a, a high rise of marital dysfunction and the divorce rates were through the roof. Sounds very much like the world we live in where the priests have adulterated the message to such a degree that people now serve God based off opinions and political agendas and our worship of God is more convenient than it is sacrificial and um, divorce rates are through the roof actually the church and the world have equal divorce rates now God God doesn't influence our marriage like he used to anymore so it's almost as if Malachi could as well been a prophet in our time he was a prophet ahead of his time He's so much ahead of his time that his book covers um, 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 the first time, the only time we see the windows of heaven being open is before Abraham. So the Bible says in Noah that the windows of heaven opened and there was a flood. And next in, in Malachi, we cover, God says in response to all this chaos, I'm going to send a, a messenger who's going to prepare the way, John the Baptist. And then I'm going to second, get a second messenger who is going to um, purify the priests and the sacrifices. Listen to this. A second messenger, Jesus, who is going to purify the priest and the sacrifice. Because in the era of Jesus, he's the high priest. He's the ultimate sacrifice. We are the priests and we are supposed to lay down our bodies as a sacrifice. Sacrifice, and this second messenger was sent to purify the priests and the sacrifice in one go. His book also ends talking about eschatology and talks about um, Elijah coming before Christ's second advent. So this is a prophet who spans pre-Abrahamic -pre um, conversations and goes all the way to the end when Jesus comes. He's a prophet ahead of his time. And it is in this book that God wants to remind us about the tithe. The last book before everything goes quiet for 400 years. In four chapters and 44 verses, the highlight and the verse everybody remembers is do not rob God. You rob God because of your tithe. So the conversation really is about repentance. But when asked, how should we repent? God says, you are keeping my stuff with your stuff. You're keeping my money with your money you're not returning the parts that belongs to me. It is in this book that God decides to talk about the tithe just before Christ. He talks about the tithe. How, how, how unimportant have we made the last Old Testament conversation? Malachi is actually described as an Old Testament prophet, as a New Testament prophet in Old Testament times. Because he was talking about things about restoring fathers to sons and sons to their fathers, which is a very New Testament conversation. It is in this book that we talk about the tithe. So it would do us good to look at Malachi 3 with different eyes. Malachi 3, chapter, 8, verse, chapter 3, verse 8 says this, Will a man rob God? And how have you robbed me in tithes and offering? God is so ticked off by their refusal to obey his commands that he calls it robbery. He says, you're keeping your things with mine. You're keeping your money with mine. There's wrongful custody of the money that should be mine. You are robbing me. So he placed this nation, and he doesn't place it. He says, you are under a curse. Your, your, your actions have put you under a limitation. Verse 9 says, the whole nation is under that because you are, you are mixing my things with your things. How many of you have lived with a roommate that does not know the dividing line? What milk is their milk and what milk is your milk? What yogurt is your yogurt and what yogurt is their yogurt? When you come back with your leftovers, they, don't, they think the fridge, because it is one, means everybody has access. Access to How many of you have had to label your food living with a roommate? Label your toilet tissue just in case. <laughs> 
But they are not the first to suffer this. The Bible says in Genesis 4 verse 5 that God disrespected Cain's sacrifice and Cain himself because Cain held onto what belonged to God. The Bible says in, in Joshua chapter 7 that after they had conquered Jericho, and their first city that they conquered, when they went to AI, a much smaller city, AI dealt mercilessly with them because somebody had held on to a part that belonged to God. So they are not the first people to, to have to pay the price for that. So if you look at the pattern there, the pattern then goes, if you rob God, you suffer for it. If you mix God's stuff with your stuff, you pay the price. If you return to God, what belongs to him, he blesses you. If you follow the story of Levi, Levi was the father of the priesthood of the law. The Bible says in Genesis chapter, I think in Genesis chapter 49, Levi and his brother Simeon did something wrong and their father cursed them. And the curse was you will be scattered among the tribes of your brothers. That was the cause. It was still this tribe that God decided in, in Hebrews chapter 7, 9 to 10, says that God gathered them to himself. Melchizedek came, came and received a tithe from Abraham. And the reason why God reversed the cause of Jacob, their, their father, and gathered them to himself to be his own priests was because the Bible says that Levi was in Abraham when Abraham paid the tithe. So the tithe has the power for four generations. That means your great grandkids can reap the benefits of your obedience today. Because to God, Levi paid his tithe in his great grandfather. So that tithe reversed the course that Jacob put on him. God did the exact opposite. Instead of scattering them, he gathered them to himself because of the tithe. So the pattern is, if you rob God, you pay for it. If you return to God what is his, he blesses you for it. Sometimes our, our challenge is not because of prayerlessness. It's not because um, of a lack of knowledge. Sometimes our challenge is just disobedience. Because we refuse to give God what belongs to him. Some of you are presently dealing with this. As I'm talking now, some of you are realizing this might just be the reason for all the difficulty I've been going through. Because when I mix my things and God, God stains with my things, I get into trouble. God considers wrongful custody theft. He says, you have robbed me. <laughs> this is not a message of co condemnation, really. I'm just trying to open your eyes to see things the way God sees them. The, the Bible goes on to say, Malachi chapter 3, verse 10. I'm, I'm going somewhere with this. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse that there might be food in my house. Try me in this. That word, um, try me, other translations say, test me. Others say, prove me. This is the only recorded time in scripture where God says, he's asking his people to test him in response to a particular instruction. God is saying, obey me and see what I do. Try me. And the picture there is the trying of gold. Gold is tried with fire to reveal the quality of the gold. God is saying, if you obey me, you will see a dimension of me that you've not seen before. Try me. I don't know if you've ever been in a fight before or somebody annoys you. You tell the person, try me. Try me. <laughs> what you're telling, with them, telling them is that there's a demon on the inside of me that I usually keep under control. If you want to see that demon manifest, do it one more time. Cross this line. Come. <laughs> Come at me, bro. It's so God is saying. <laughs> Most of you are like, Pastor, already relax, <laughs> breathe. God is saying, Obey me and see, 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 just, just, just what I do. Just obey me in this. In this. Try me in this. And see if I will not open the windows of heaven. The Bible says, Hebrews chapter 6, verse 18, it is impossible for God to lie. That's enough to feast on for one year. It's impossible. So what you should aim to get, this is not even in my notes, what you need to get is get God to say something or hear what God has said. If it is impossible, let me explain what impossible to lie means. means even if it was not and then God says it, it has to be. 
Okay, most of you missed it. If you're wise, you would see this is how the Genesis creation story existed. There was darkness and chaos and soup. And then God said, oh, let there be light. And because he cannot lie, the light has to be. So you're sick. Just find where God said you are healed. And because God cannot lie, you have to be healed. Do you understand? That's why you find the rhema of God, the particular specific word of God for you in a specific um, 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 condition. The Bible goes on to say, bring all the tithes, verse 10, into the storehouse that there might be food in my house. That, is, that has caused a lot of confusion because we think that the reason for the tithe is food in God's house. We think the reason for the tithe is um, money in the church account. While that is incredible, and we'll not be able to do what we do without the money in the account, because nobody goes to the bank and says, Thus saith the Lord, give me stuff. We still have to pay for it. That is good, but that's not the reason. That's the consequence. Okay, let me make a claim for consequences. The consequence of eating is a full belly. The reason for eating is to live. The consequence of drinking water is a wet mouth. The reason is hydration. The consequence of coming to church is spending time in a designated space with other children of God. The reason is spiritual growth and maturity. The consequence of going to Chick-fil-A is a spicy chicken sandwich in the name of Jesus. The reason we go is because we want our self-esteem popped up a little bit. So nice to meet you. Nice to meet you as well. That's why we go. So the reason for the tithe is not the same as the consequence. Because God will not leave the reason for the tithe to the financial acumen of men. Let me explain. You bring your money. If the reason for the tithe was money in the bank account, that means it is left to I and Pastor Ambi and the level of our financial literacy to handle the tithe. But that's just the consequence. So God will not leave your blessing based on our management. He secures the blessing in a place man cannot mess with. So most of you have been tripped up by the handling of the currency. And we think that the way the currency is handled determines the blessing of my obedience. But the abuse of the currency does not negate the blessing of my obedience. God keeps the reason to himself. The reason of the tithe is that it triggers God's I wills. Because when God wants to bless you, he gives you something to obey. I'll say that again. When God wants to bless you, he gives you an instruction to obey. Because when you obey it, you give him the legal right. I don't, this is the difference between a salary and a reward. Rewards are not determined by the work. Salaries are. Wages are determined by work. Reward is left to the, the person who is rewarded. You can do something and I choose to reward you with $2. You can do exactly the same thing I choose to reward you with $2 million. It's on me. So God puts the reward of obedience on him so that per what you're going through, he decides how he's going to reward you because you obeyed. Do you understand? So God says, try me in this. There are things I want to do to you. Someone, someone actually preached, God help me. That God, someone actually preached and said, if the, the verse had said, uh, um, you rob me with your tithes, it would be understandable that God is talking about the fact that you're holding the tithe is the only reason why I say you're robbing me. But the verse actually says, you rob me with your tithes and with your offering. And the offerings are not mandatory. You actually decide what you want to bring as an offering, how many of it you want to bring. That's a free will thing. So if God is saying you're robbing me, he must not just be talking about the obligation, the command in their time of the tithe. In us is our personal conviction and our revelation. In Malachi, he was not just talking about money. He was saying there's something I want to do. You're robbing me of the opportunity to bless you. I want to bless you. 
You are a chosen generation, a people I've called to myself, but you're robbing me an opportunity to distinguish you from the rest of the nations of the world because of your disobedience. When God wants to bless you, what does he do? He gives you something to obey. When we tithe, we trigger the I will of God. So what are the benefits of the tithe? And let me begin to preach. Number one, say, number one is this. Secures my resources. The tithe secures my resources. Verse 11 says this. When you bring in the tithe, I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes so that he will not destroy the fruits of your ground, says the Lord of hosts. That word devourer, it means to eat up, to burn, to consume. How many of you have ever experienced a blessing and all of a sudden something breaks down in the house? You get a raise and then you have to replace your, your, your oven. Or you, you, you get a raise and you have to replace the car or service the car. You, you get that bonus and then you have to go to the hospital and pay for something. Um, it's almost as if you're being, there's, 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 there's a fraud alert, a fraud activity on your bank account. But when you go to your account, it's all you. It's all you spending it. No other person has access to your account. It feels like some other person is sharing your salary with you. But upon scrutinization of my bank statement, I realized I swiped all of this Personally, it's as if I'm burning the candle on two ends. Because it is one thing to receive a blessing from God, and it's another thing for it to be protected. Returning the tithe activates divine security for the rest. Returning the tithe activates divine security. God becomes your offensive line. He snaps you the blessing and then covers for you while you make your play. Most of us get the blessing and there's no offensive line to protect you. And the devil just comes at you. Okay, some of you don't do football. Most of you were in, in, in the club a while ago. In, in the club, when you make your way to the club, there is this guy, hopefully he's bulky, and he filters the people who have access to the party or to the event. He's called the bouncer. God becomes your harvest bouncer. He decides who has access to your money when you tithe. He, he decides. The Bible says he doesn't. He's not saying I'm going to send the angels to contend with it. They say, no, I will. Myself. I'm not sending anybody to do this. I will come by myself and rebuke the devourer for your sakes. It activates protection over what is left. When I release the tithe, God rebukes the devil. When I, when I tithe, I activate a covenant of protection. So the tithe ensures that I have the protection to enjoy the fullness of God's blessing in my life. The tithe ensures I have that protection. Number two, the tithe guarantees my harvest. The Bible says, and I will rebuke the devourer for your sake so that he will not destroy the fruit of your ground. 11 continues by saying, nor shall the vine fail to bear fruit in the field. The tithe doesn't just secure the harvest. It locks in my next harvest. The, the, the tithe guarantees that this harvest is followed, followed up by the next one. The tithe ensures that my present and my future harvest is secure. The tithe guarantees a harvest I cannot see yet. The tithe goes into my future and secures things that God is releasing to me that I have not yet begun to experience. I told you that the tithe fulfills all kinds of financial laws. One of the laws is sowing and reaping. So when I receive from God and I give a tithe. It fulfills the law of sowing and reaping. What is a tithe now actually becomes a seed for tomorrow. So returning the tithe ensures that I have a harvest in my future. I know people who have triggered a raise by tithing the raise. Like they trigger it. They almost like force the issue. Like God, I'm believing you for this. I'm going to begin to tithe like I've gone to be receiving it. And God cannot owe a man. If you call that his portion, guess what he's going to do? He has to give you commensurate to what you're releasing. And I know people who have received that raise because they had faith. I'm not saying you should do it. I'm saying if God leads you to do it, do it. But he guarantees my harvest. The Bible says in, in the same verse 11 in the NIV, it says, The vines of your field will not drop their fruit before it is ripe. It's called near success syndrome. 
Just before the deal is made, before it clicks, it falls through. Just before the client signs the contract, they just ghost you. Um, just before, um, your, your, it's, it's time to, for you to be, be proposed to. And then he, he falls off the surface of the earth. Well, it's time for you to propose to her. And then something just happens. It's a near success syndrome. You carry a baby and, and, and then you lose the child. Near success. God is saying, I'm not just going to secure what you have now. I'm going to make sure that what you have coming for you gets to you. That it does not fail. Do you understand? Most of you are excited about that. that it, it means this. When a, when a tree loses a fruit before time, it means the tree is not strong enough to bear the fruits. God is saying, I'm going to make you strong enough to hold everything I have coming to you. If I've promised that your business is going to do well, I'm going to make you strong enough to handle how well the business is going to do. It's a blessing. So the seed produces a harvest by principle, but the tithe protects the harvest by promise. The seed of the tithe produces a harvest by principle. Seed time and harvest will never fail. It's a principle. But the tithe protects the seed and the harvest by a promise. God is saying, I've blessed you now, and because you have obeyed me, I'm going to make sure that what you're enjoying, the 90%, is not accessed by anything that I don't ordain. And you know what? I'm going to look into your future, and the blessing I have coming for you, it's not going to go halfway. You're not going to have to meet it halfway. It's going to come all the way to you. You're not going to be teased by your promise anymore. You're not going to be teased by the chances, the possibilities of something happening. He's saying it's going to come to you all the time. If you believe that, just say amen. amen. So it secures my resources. It guarantees my harvest. And number three, it opens the heavens over me. Verse three says this, bring all the, verse 10 says, bring all the tithes into the storehouse that there might be food in my house. And try me now in this, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour you out such a blessing that you cannot contain, you will not have any room to receive it. No other form of giving is recorded to open the windows of heaven. Every other form of giving is going to give you a harvest in multiple folds. But there is no other form of giving in the Bible recorded to clearly state if you give in this way, it's going to trigger something in heaven. The last time the heavens were open, it, it, it was a flood. Anytime the heavens open, there is a flood. Let, let me let that sit. The last time the heavens opened, the earth could not contain the rain. So it makes sense. Malachi, a prophet ahead of his time, saying when the heavens open, you cannot contain such blessing. Let me tell you the, 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 the beauty of God. He does not say a blessing because that would be one blessing. He said such blessing. It's a blank, blank check. You want five blessings? I just promise you when I'm done, you cannot contain what I'm going to give you. We minimize God with the way we think. With what we expect. We minimize God. He's saying the results, the reward, the harvest for one tithe is going to be such that you cannot contain it. Now think if you live a life of constant obedience to God, you constantly have the heavens open over you. You wonder why people do in a few months what you've been trying to do. You're saving to buy a house, year 10, and God is saying to you, I can give you the money in one month. Now, most of you just block that out because you cannot see how it's going to happen. That's because you're doing the math. If you leave the math and do the mystery, your life will change. Because it's not up to me to determine how it happens. It's that I can make a demand on God because you said, my bank account can still hold a few more zeros. So I'm still expecting you to get to the point where I cannot contain it. The Bible says, the heavens will be open over me. So the tithe releases a flood of blessings. Someone actually said, the blessing is ideas, is insights, is concepts that can change your life forever. Whatever the blessing is, you have a right to ask for it if you tithe. 
What is the tithe? 10%. When people argue about the tithe, it blows my mind. Here's why it blows my mind. God blesses you with something. Can I have the, the, the money, please? Let, let me have the money. Let me, let me show you something. God blesses you with something and tells you to give 10% of it back. And we find it difficult. We find it, can I have the money? You can stand. Right, thank you. Just, just wait. So God gives you this. Most of you are wondering. And I, I know he said the church is doing well. Will the board allow him to do that? So who can I call to waylay the pastor? Um, these are not real, so I don't, we don't get in trouble on the way home. These are not, they're going to be in the trash when I'm done. Please do not come after my car. Don't come to my house. These are not real currencies. Please fight the urge to wait for me on my house. But God gives you this and tells you, give me this. How wicked and selfish must you be to argue it? Oh, it's the Old Testament. It's not new. As New Testament believers, yes, you're not under the law. We've reverted back to the original intent, which was tithing by revelation and conviction. He did not abolish the act. It abolished the context. The Bible says, if the priest has changed, then the law must change by necessity. And the law is we don't give because God said so. We believe, we give because we, are, we have decided and we're devoted. So God gives you this. Can I have, can I have one person on stage? Ludwig, come. This is Ludwig. I like using Ludwig. Get to, get to make him uncomfortable sometimes. So God, if you want to believe this, you can believe this by faith. Amen. <laughs> So God gives you this. This is yours. Oh, Amen. Really? Yes. Don't do that. <laughs> Come. Give me the umbrella. Come, Morris. You're going to help me with this. Let, 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 let me show you something. Because the ties really um, help me. How do you, there we go. It's the fancy one. Um, Come. Stand here. Hold this. The ties really is about c- c- covering. The word rob means to cover. It means to deceive. It means to be dishonest, but it means to cover. So God gives you money. This is money in terms. Gives you resources. Gives you this. And then if you hide it, try to hide it away from me, God. The Bible says because you have hidden it, you have placed yourself under a curse. So what you do to the money happens to you. So it's not because God wants to, we've been redeemed from the cost of the law, yes. But through disobedience, you, you, you place yourself. Let, let, me, let me paint the picture more accurately. Come on, sorry. When you hide the money, you place yourself under a cost. Do you understand what I mean? What is a cost? It's a predetermined limitation of how high and how far you can go. This is how far I can go. It's something that decides how excellent you're going to be, how influential you're going to be, how blessed you're going to be. The tithe is about who is covering your resources. So he says, you are robbing me of it. You're covering it from me. And because you're covering it from me, you have entered under a covering. He says, if you bring to me, give me one, what belongs to me, I will open the windows of heaven and make sure the rain falls on you. If you uncover it to me, I uncover my heaven to you. What you do to your money, you place yourself under a cross. Do you understand what I'm saying? That's the simple truth about the, the, the tithe. Now, it does not mean you cannot jump because under this umbrella, lovely, j- j- jump, try to jump jump. You can jump. You can excel. You're doing well to a certain extent. And then there's a cap. Something. That thing determines how high you can go. Do you understand? So the tithe 
It's not about money. It's about the fact that when Jesus came, the Bible says, and the heavens opened up. And he said, this is my son. Our elder brother, the firstborn of our family, got the heavens opened once and for all, for all of us. Why would we let a lie and some notes and coins and currency make us live under an umbrella? And I know the song says, come under my umbrella. Under my, under my, under my umbrella. Ella, 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 Ella. Turn to your neighbor and say, I know the song says, come under my umbrella. Then look them dead in the eyes and say, avoid the umbrella. Turn to the other person that you ignored in all of this fun. For some reason, you have beef with them. And say, I know the popular song says, come under my umbrella. Ella, Ella, Ella. <laughs> Ella, 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 say to them. <laughs> but I want you to avoid the umbrella. How many of you have been blessed by this?